portal, Prometheus. Prometheus was a cousin of Zeus, uh, a titan. Prometheus became the first cultural hero for the Greeks. He stole fire from the gods and brought it from Olympus. For giving the gift of fire to man, Prometheus paid a terrible price. Prometheus was taken by Zeus and chained to a rock on the edge of the earth and there made to pay for his sins for thousands of years, having his liver eaten out every day only to have it grow back because of course you can't kill a god or an immortal. And as a result of that, his suffering was unending. In the play Prometheus Bound, written around 400 BC, the Athenian dramatist Aeschylus wrote that the cliffs where Prometheus was chained were guarded by mythology's most fearsome creatures so that no one would ever attempt to rescue him. These, he wrote, were the sharp beak hounds of Zeus. There were many uh, Greek and Latin authors who wrote about griffins and as time went on, we knew more and more about their behavior and their appearance. Soon it came out that they built their nests on the ground and that they laid their eggs in the nests and that they guarded gold. The Scythians, a nomadic tribe from Central Asia, were instrumental in extending the trade route from Asia to the Aegean around the sixth century. Though they had no written language, scholars like Aristeus, a Greek traveler who visited the mountains in 675 BC, collected tales of griffins and helped disseminate them worldwide. It's possible that the, the Scythians told these stories about ferocious griffins guarding the gold in order to keep people out of the gold territory. Uh, but uh, more and more details came out about griffins, always the same. And it really made me curious about what kind of natural fact could have kept this story consistent over a millennium of, uh, of traveler's tales. In her quest to learn the truth about the griffin, folklorist Adrian Mayer retraced the ancient trade routes, searching for the likely sources of gold. Mayer found clues in old maps and ancient place names along the old caravan routes that led from Central Asia. She focused on the area surrounding the mountains called Altai, an ancient Mongolian name for gold. Consulting with geomorphologists, Mayer learned the gold would have eroded out of the slopes where the mountains joined the Gobi Desert. The area Mayer pinpointed as the Griffin's gold fields was known to every paleontologist she talked with. Treasure had been found there. Fossil treasure, discovered by the adventurer Roy Chapman Andrews in the 1920s. He and his men found that the most ubiquitous fossil there were large beaked dinosaurs. So they had four legs and a skull with a really large curved beak. These were the remains of the Protoceratops, a plant-eating dinosaur of the late Cretaceous period, one of the last to roam the Earth before a mass extinction some 65 million years ago. What made these fossils so unique was their state of preservation. The Gobi Desert was another very unusual situation where you had catastrophes of sandstorms that literally just buried animals. If you've ever been in a sandstorm, you will understand what it's like. You can do nothing. You, you, you can't open your eyes. You can't move. And they happen suddenly. You can literally just hunker down and get buried. And all of a sudden, you get a catastrophic collapse of that sand dune. And in, in a matter of seconds, it's completely covered. And if it stays that way, if the sand doesn't shift anymore, then potentially that can become fossilized. The skeletons are sometimes found in standing position, eroding out of sandstone cliffs. And the cliffs are red sandstone so that the white bones really stand out. Anytime you get an animal that's more or less completely preserved, that's articulated, it makes it a lot easier to envision what that animal would look like. To the ancient Scythians and Greeks, the remains of the Protoceratops may have been seen as proof that the legendary griffin existed. We can imagine that travelers uh, to Asia, Central Asia, into Scythian territory, certainly heard the story and they may have been shown maybe a claw or a beak or part of a fossil and they would 
they would certainly then believe the story. Only one discrepancy remained. Unlike griffins, protoceratops did not have wings. But a close examination of the neck and skull of the dinosaur may provide an explanation. I asked paleontologist uh, how they would uh, account for the wings that were shown on griffins. And it turns out that the protoceratops has a frill at the back of its neck. And in profile, that would look something like a wing structure. The abundance of preserved dinosaur eggs on the site would have completed the picture for the ancients, who had heard tales of griffins fiercely protecting the gold with which they lined their nests. Here, Mayer was sure, was the source of the legendary griffin, brought to life by travelers who had glimpsed the bones of an equally fantastic creature, one from Earth's uncharted past. But now, Mayer's modern-day quest was about to yield another invaluable prize. Waiting to be translated among the accounts she had gathered were clues that would create an ancient atlas, a treasure map for those in search of prehistoric monsters. For 200 years, the dusty earth of the Aegean has yielded up its secrets. In the 1800s, every civilized country sent expeditions to uncover and claim its ancient treasures. When Charles Darwin disseminated his theory of evolution, it sparked a virtual bone rush across these same lands. Thousands of fossil specimens from the Pleistocene and Miocene eras were recovered on the islands and the mainland. But despite hundreds of excavations, there was no hard evidence that the mighty civilizations that once ruled this land recognized its prehistoric wonders. A few 19th century scholars theorized that the ancients must have seen these fossils and perhaps recognized what they were, but modern authorities largely dismissed the idea, sure that the understanding of fossil remains was beyond their scope. This conceit was seemingly confirmed by the fact that there were no references to large or unusual bones in the works of Aristotle or Lucretius, the most widely read scholars, who were considered the great scientific minds of the day. But folklorist Adrian Mayer looked beyond the usual sources cited by modern classicists. Instead of concentrating on the great philosophers, she pursued the popular works of writers like Pausanias, who lived around A.D. 150. He was a travel writer in almost in the modern sense. He would, he would just write travelogues of various areas in Greece and which temple you should go to to see what and what sort of marvels and wonderful things you would find in each town. Among the roadside attractions Pausanias recommended were the best places to see the bones of giants. In the harbor of Miletus, part of an island broke away, revealing the bones of the giant Asterios. The corpse is not an inch less than 15 feet tall. He recorded something like a dozen fossil sites around the Greek world, and he saw, these are eyewitness accounts. He's one, he's one of the first to speak of fossils that he actually saw emerging from the ground, and he recounts the excitement, the speculation that happened whenever these, these fossils were exposed by either heavy rainstorms or earthquakes or landslides or just erosion. Pausanias' travelogue gave Mayer an idea. I made a map of, of all of the ancient find sites where ancient writers said, we found giant bones here. More than 100 accounts from 30 different writers in, in antiquity, both Greek and Latin. Then, with the help of paleontologists in the United States, Europe, Greece, and Turkey, she compared them to major fossil beds documented in the modern era. The correlation that emerged was nearly one to one. They matched up. It's just that no one had ever bothered to make a careful map of the ancient find sites. And the reason is that classical scholars had dismissed most of those accounts as traveler's tales, fantasies, fictions, evidence of superstition. Though they were called giant's bones, or the graves of heroes, 
The completed map and written accounts offered proof that the ancient world viewed fossils in much the same way as modern man. Prehistoric bones were hunted, collected, measured, and displayed. Major fossil beds were causes of wonder and tourist attractions well worth a sea voyage. Now, armed with this growing collection of written evidence, Mayer felt sure there had to be physical evidence as well. But where were the fossils that had been collected, reburied, or placed as offerings on the altars of temples? Mayer scoured the archaeological field notebooks of all the excavations conducted in Greece in the 19th and 20th centuries, looking for any mention of fossils recovered inside temples or buried ceremonially. I would find 